That's my cue. So, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, is the psalmist right? I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And it is good uh, to gather together. There is nothing, nothing like it. And we look forward to the day when everybody can be here again. Even those who missed the time change, we'll see them in about an hour here. So just keep, watch the back doors. I'll give you a sign when they come. If somebody comes at 10.30, I'll give you a sign while I'm preaching. Just... <clears throat> Take a look. Okay, um, I want to congratulate boys basketball. If you didn't know, our boys team, uh, high school team, made it to uh, state and won state. So they are the state champions. That is so awesome, 59-50 yesterday. Um, also, we talked yesterday, or last week, uh, Austin introduced our car decals. And I want to point out, I don't have a great video for this like he did. He was awesome. But uh, they are... Uh, removable. So if you change membership or something like that, <laughs> you want to go to a different church, you can just take it right off. It comes right off. I actually uh, put it on mine in one spot, and then I decided I, I liked it in a different spot, and so I pulled it off, and I put it into a different spot several days later, and it still clung, and so it's, a, it's like a cling-on thing. But you know, why are we doing this? One, you know, it's, it's a unity thing, but also we have the tagline on here, love God, love all people. When somebody sees that and they say, see HMBC, and they might have to, if they're new to our community, might have to look that up, HMBC, what is that? And it will come up if they're in Hillsboro, it'll come up Hillsboro MB Church. Uh, otherwise, if they're in Heston, it'll come up as Heston MB Church. But if they Google it here, uh, then it'll come up as ours. And, uh, and then say, there are people that says, you know, they love God, love all people. And say, I might give church a chance. Maybe I'd, maybe I'd will, be willing to try that because in our world today, the church doesn't have a good rep, right? We uh, have a reputation of being unloving and uncaring. And so this is an evangelistic tool. I encourage you, put it on your car um, and uh, try it out. There's a thing on how to uh, put it on your car in the back there with it. You can get the welcome center or at the tables uh, on the entryways and grab those, put them on there. And maybe somebody will try out church and they will come and they will say, and they'll hear the gospel for the first time and maybe give their life to Christ just because you put a car decal on. It can happen. I believe it. So, um, we have another couple things, interesting, exciting things to announce. Um, next uh, two weeks, uh, on Palm Sunday, March 28th. We're going to have a kids' choir here on Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. called His Little Feet. There are kids from uh, different countries that, uh, they are, that have uh, a need for orphan care and support. And uh, so they're going to put on a dynamic presentation uh, here with singing and choreographed dancing and all of that uh, on Sunday evening, 630. Invite people. Uh, let's fill this place up and support that. You will not want to miss it. So just trust me, you don't want to miss it. And we will be able to televise it, too. So it'll be on our Internet as well for those who aren't able to make it out. Um, in that same vein, as we are, you know, working more towards developing a, an orphan care ministry and foster care ministry here at the church, I um, wanted to invite Susie up, where is she sitting? Um, and she's going to share with us uh, something that we started, uh, we, we decided to do this about a year ago, but we're now in the ready, in this phase to launch this called Care Portal. I mentioned it last week, but uh, Susie's going to explain more about that for us. And I've got a mic for you right here. Well, my perspective on foster care changed when my daughter Jocelyn, and some of you know her, and her husband, Darren Busick, took foster children into their home. Now the term foster care has names and has faces. And I was going to show you a photo of those sweet faces, but I would have had to fuzz them out because they can't be on social media. So you'll have to trust me. They have sweet little faces. James 1.27 tells us, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, 
to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So we're not all called to do foster care, to invite these children into our homes, but we are all called to care for orphans. And the United States has orphans, this little feet, God's little feet choir. We often, when we hear the term orphans, we think of other countries, but we have children here. And some of the children in my daughter's home are orphans. They are wards of the state. They have no parents officially, legally. So it has changed my perspective. I'm not able to show the video that I wanted to show you today, so I will share some things that you would have heard on that video. In the United States, on any given day, there are four million children in danger of entering the foster care system. Many of those are for preventable reasons. On that same given day, 400,000 children are actually in foster care. 50% of the homeless people on the streets were at some point in foster care during their young lives. 60% of women taken out of prostitution or sex trafficking were in foster care. 75% of those incarcerated in our prisons were in foster care at some point. It's a huge problem, and if there is something that we can do wouldn't we want to do it if we knew that somebody down the street was in danger of losing their children for something that we could do something about? Wouldn't we want to do that in our own community especially? And that's where Care Portal comes in. Care Portal connects the needs with the resources of meeting those needs to hopefully prevent a child from entering the foster care system. And it uses technology. So here's how it works. A social worker who's been working with this family knows of a need. It might be the need for beds for the children. Kids are taken out of homes because the parents aren't able to care for the basic needs, such as beds. Maybe they need a vacuum sweeper to keep their um, house cleaner. Maybe they need to pay their electric bill or repair their car so that they can get to work, so that they can keep their children. So the social worker knows the needs, and it is vetted. It's not the same family asking for help with the electric bill every month. It's a legitimate need. She sends that to Care Portal, and Care Portal technology sends that out to all of the churches who are enrolled in Care Portal, who are Care Portal churches, and your church is about to become one. That church then sends it to their enrolled, to, the, to their members. And somebody says, oh, I have a vacuum I haven't used in years. I can donate that vacuum. Somebody else says, oh, I have $100 I can add to a car repair bill. Somebody else says, I have money. It might be one person. It might be two to three people. It might be two to three churches meeting a need. It's working together to meet those needs. And usually it's physical needs. But the beauty of Care Portal is that it allows us the opportunity to develop relationships, to make a connection. Imagine that you have, most of us, I'm guessing, have grown up in churches with that support system. Many of these people do not have that, and so we would be able to provide a support system for them. You see them in the grocery store later and say, hey, how's it going? You have a connection with them to build on that. What we do matters, and what we do changes not only children's lives, but changes us as well. Okay, that's the end of the video. Now I want to share three amazing things that I have found about Care Portal, and one is that basic, we can meet needs. Who am I that I can go out and make a difference in somebody's life? I can do that through this Care Portal with the help of others in my church, in my community. The second amazing thing is not only are we meeting the needs of a family, but we're meeting the need of a social worker. Social workers have to tell families no all the time. They don't have money to pay for car repairs. They don't have money to buy beds to put in homes. 
So their answer to the family is often, no, I can't help you. Care Portal can change that no into a maybe, can change that maybe into a yes. We can get a bed for your child. You can keep your child. And that changes the heart of the social worker. It changes the perspective on their job. And they see the church as a caring, acting entity. And the third, probably to me the most amazing thing, is that Care Portal is the heart of God working with the government. And have you ever heard those two together before? Um, so there are three parts. There's the state part, Department for Children and Families, DCF. They're the ones who, they work with the family and they have the power to remove a child from a family. And then there are organizations or ministries such as St. Francis Ministry. And they contract with the state to manage the foster care. So DCF takes the child out, St. Francis puts them in a home, if there's a home available, but that's another whole story and we won't get into that. And then there's the church who helps to step up to meet those needs. And from our perspective as the church, it's a few clicks on the computer, a few phone calls, that item is delivered, that need is met. There's no paperwork. There are no obligations, there are no strings, there's no hoops. And when have you ever worked with a government that you didn't have any of those? I have done numerous care portal drop-offs and it's always the same. Click, click, where am I going? Take it and it's done. And to me, that's bordering on miraculous. Um, there may not be frequent needs in Marion County, but your church would have the option to set a mileage parameter that if you want to receive notification of needs in Harvey County or McPherson County, you would be welcome to do that. And even if there aren't a lot of needs in Marion County, there are multiple ways to support foster care families. Um, and I know that your church is working on, has a heart for developing a ministry to foster care families, and that is exciting to hear that that's already happening. Care Portal is an, the domestic arm of the Global Orphan Project that was started by a man in Kansas City. He um, has, is supporting orphanages in Africa and Haiti, and I'm not all not sure uh, where all else. I do have a book that tells the story, which is an amazing story of how, how Care Portal started here in the United States, because orphan care is done very differently in other countries. The church actually does it. That's not the way we're set up. So how can the church support orphan care in the system that we have? And Care Portal is what came out of that. I thank you for your willingness to listen, uh, to me and to God for your willingness to be a part of this and for the heart that you have for the children and the families in your own community. As a Missouri pastor once said, the more we meet these needs, the more we look like the church. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> oh, and I was going to yeah. say, I'm sorry, Jeremy. Okay. I do have that book, and if anybody wants to borrow it, I would more than happily lend that to you, so I will be here after after the service as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, the church is oftentimes these days criticized for being saying we're pro-life and we only care about though the unborn, but that's clearly not the case. Uh, and we care about we're pro-life from the stage of the unborn all the way through life, and we need to take care of people at all those stages. Um, it, the way you're going to get notified about needs is through the prayer line. And so if you're not on the prayer line, fill out a card in front of you and slip that in. Give us your email and say you want to be on the prayer line so that you get those, those needs. Our liaisons here, the people who are coordinating this from Hillsborough MB or Brandy Hine and Heather Christner. And so they'll be our, our two people working with that. Miriam, I just saw you. Uh, we've got another exciting uh, ministry. We've been talking about uh, the need to uh, pray more as a church. And um, Miriam and Judy Hebert and I uh, met this week to talk about what that can look like. And Miriam's going to talk about one of those 
options, and let's just take this off again. So good morning. This is an exciting announcement that I'm going to give you. So if I just had you think for a moment in your mind's eye of somebody who is a good friend, I'm sure a lot of you would have a picture pop up in your mind. And if you thought of how you became good friends, you would probably think of things like you spent time together, you had good conversation together, you, ha uh, you got to know one another, you took time. Well, for those of us who have relationship with Jesus Christ, John 15, 15 tells us that Jesus no longer calls us servants. He calls us friends. And we can know the master's business. And so it's pretty awesome to think that the creator of the universe calls us his friends. So we would like to start giving everyone an opportunity to come join together for an hour a week and to spend time talking and conversing with our friend Jesus, getting to know his heart, getting to know the master's business, while also lifting up our prayers and petitions to seek his heart, to hear from him, and just to be with him. Now, I know many of you are already involved in prayer very faithfully, and some of you are a part of other prayer groups, and that's just fantastic. But we can see every single day that our world is not getting any better, and the enemy is only growing stronger. And so we feel like our church needs to link arms even more in the act of prayer. And so we're going to join together. We're going to be lifting up the people in our church. We're going to lift up needs of our church, the greater church as a whole, our community, our state, our country, and our world. There's not really going to be an agenda. We're just going to come together and just pray. We want to become more and more a house of prayer. So some of you might think, wow, an hour in prayer, that's a long time to pray. Or what if I have to pray out loud? Are they going to expect me to pray out loud? Absolutely not. Um, just come join us. You can just pray in your heart. If the Spirit leads you to pray out loud, that's great. Um, all ages are welcome. Students, if you have lunch hour open and you want to come join us, you are free to come. But all ages. And so we're going to start meeting this Tuesday, March 16th, in the hearth room for an hour from 12 o'clock noon till 1 o'clock p.m. And we're just going to come together and pray. And so if you want to join us, please do. We'll kind of you do it like we're doing in church. We'll wear masks in, but if you want to take your mask off once you're seated in there, we'll kind of space out a little bit. And so you, you can feel safe there, too. But we just really invite you to come join us as we lift our hearts in prayer and become more of a house of prayer here in this church. Awesome. Thanks, Miriam. Yeah, we're going to take some time to pray right now. We want to lift up the Cox family. I don't, I'm sure many of you have heard, but probably, maybe not everybody. Uh, but they lost their oldest son now almost two years after losing Demarius. Um, uh, so they've lost both of their boys now. Uh, some of you, Demetrius has a son in Florida, Demetrius Jr., and <clears throat> he passed away, oh, I forget my days right, I think it was Sunday uh, night, uh, which was his birthday. Um, and he was shot and killed uh, in Florida. So we want to lift that family up. They're going to be leaving. I don't think they've left yet. I think they're going to be leaving this week to go out there. And um, our church has supported them financially to help get them uh, to Florida and for funeral. But also if you want to help, there's a, a, a memorial fund or a fund set up for the family at Emprise Bank that you could, can uh, donate to as well. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, Oh, our hearts break for Demetrius and Sierra and, and the girls uh, as they experience yet another tragic, unexpected loss. And when things like this happen, you know, we, we, we question uh, where you are and, and how can these things happen. It, 
as natural and normal as human beings who have a limited, finite perspective. We ask that though the, the faith of the Cox family would not be shaken, that during this time they would turn to you, that you would comfort them, that they would know you again in a real and immediate personal way in their lives, that their faith would be, become stronger, that they would be again a testimony to others as they go through these trials. We pray for all the arrangements and travels and all that for them as well. And Lord, uh, we pray for our church as we are preparing to do more and more for you. Satan doesn't like it. We have an enemy. We have an enemy that wants to stop us, that wants to distract us, that doesn't want us to be on target, to be on mission. And we pray against him. We pray for your spirit to fill us, to, to equip us and empower us to do your work. We thank you for this church that you've given us. Take, Lord, these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. Use them for your power, for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Shirley, for throwing me a softball. Jesus paid it all. I know that one. Okay, Uh, we are in Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And uh, before we go there, I got something funny happened to to Krista a little while ago. She's she's the uh, Tabor cheer coach. Now, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of that, but for this, this whole year, she's been doing that. And uh, one of the basketball games, uh, just recently, uh, one of the cheerleaders went down after the game <clears throat> outside of the gym in the, in the cafeteria area. She went down with a ba- uh, back problem. And so Krista went to go look for one of the athletic trainers that she knew. She uh, was aware of a guy named Troy, who was an athletic trainer. So she, she runs into the gym, and she, you know, he's got his mask on, and the guy that she assumed then, you know, he's masked, uh, was Troy, was walking out with the band, carrying uh, some, of the, some drumsticks and, and band equipment, which she thought was odd that Troy was, you know, helping the band out, but she, oh, I'm going to go find, go, go talk to Troy, says, Troy. One of our cheerleaders uh, has a back injury, needs your help. And this poor kid, <laughs> you know, he's like, uh, well, uh, uh, oh, okay, uh, l- let, me, let me go take this out, uh, and, I'll, and I'll be right there. And Chris is thinking, why? You're the athletic trainer. You know, why are you so worried about the drums that we need your help here? Me- We've got a medical need. This poor guy. And so he's, he's going uh, with this other girl, and they're, they're going to go help. And they, they dropped the stuff off, and, and Krista went to, was talking to Marty, who's the uh, AD there, and she, 
and she, t- she told him what's going on, and he says, she said, but I talked to Troy, and he said, Troy's not here. She said, yeah, he's right there. And Marty started laughing because he, this was not Troy, it was just a band member, the drummer. And uh, so this poor kid, he, he and, this, and this other band member, they go and they're trying to help the girl. <laughs> Uh, and bless their heart. So, um, yeah, Chris is very grateful for them. But this whole mask thing, it's tough, right? I mean, we, we, you go to the store and you think you recognize somebody and you don't, you know, or whatever. You're not sure whether to say hi. COVID has done a number on us, right? I mean, it's, it's from, from light things like this, you know, where it just makes it uncomfortable sometimes so whether you want to say something to somebody because you're not sure who they are or you make a mistake you know to actually people having real health issues and even and dying and we know people um, here who have passed away uh, due to COVID uh, it's, it's been tough but, but not only that I mean it's COVID has divided people over mask issues right uh, and protocols and it made enemies of people. It's isolated people. And people are hurting emotionally because they're isolated because they can't come together or don't feel like they're coming together. It's created uh, real issues why people can't come together and also fear. Some people just aren't coming out in public because there's real fears. And that, it's understandable, but it's, 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 it's hurting our society and it's hurting people. And it's distracted people. It's distracted Lots of us from, from doing our purpose, our God-given purpose. Because it's easy for all of us. We've gotten used to being at home and being maybe less social. Uh, we, we, there, there's been times where we can't do everything that we want to do. There's meetings that I've wanted to have here and, and start building momentum. And, we, you know, we were doing, we were, our church was building momentum before March and then, COVID happens, and we, 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 had, we lost a lot of momentum. We can't, can't do all the things. Zoom, you can't do all the meetings that you want to do by Zoom. I've got plans. I've got ideas, and we can't do them. I mean, so, uh, it, you know, it's distracted us. Sometimes, you know, no fault of ours, and sometimes a fault of ours. It's distracted us from our purpose. It's divided, isolated, and distracted. The early church in Acts was experiencing their own problems. They didn't have COVID, but they had their own problems. It started out so strong. We were reading about that, how they're enjoying each other's company and sharing all things in common, and they were on mission, and they were... And then Satan strikes. And we talked about two ways already that, that Satan was attacking the church. And one was sin within the church with Ananias and Sapphira, the hypocrisy. Uh, and then we've seen a couple times where there's been persecution. Grant talked about that last week. But outward persecution by the religious leaders. Today we're going to talk about a third uh, attack. Another, probably the most subtle attack. And that's division by distraction, or distraction by division. Which you can look at it either way. Let's look at Acts chapter 6. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, good things happening, the disciples are increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Let's stop there for just a second and explain the situation, what that, what that means. The Hellenistic and the Hebraic Jews. If you've got the NIV, that's how they interpret it. If you have a different version, they might interpret it uh, differently, translate that, those, those uh, categories differently of these two people. I like the way the NIV has labeled them then. Hellenistic and Hebraic. But what does that mean? The Hellenistic... Jews, they're both Jews, but the Hellenistic Jews were the ones that have become very Greek in culture. They've, they've adopted the Greek culture. Maybe they've gone out in the diaspora, that's the, when the scattering of the Jews, and they've been a part outside of Israel, been a part of other cultures, and they've adopted a lot of those ways, and now they're in Jerusalem. 
The Hellenized Jews, the Hellenistic Jews spoke Greek more than they spoke Aramaic. They may have even forgotten Aramaic or never learned Aramaic. But Greek would have been their primary language. So that in language and culture, they were different. But they were still Jews. And then you had the, the, uh, or the, the uh, oh, sorry. My, my version has Hellenistic. Which one did I put up here? Hellenistic, okay. Uh, there's another version that Grecian, same like Greek Jews. Um, then you had the Hebraic Jews. The Hebraic Jews were the really just still acted and did the part of Jews. They stayed in Palestine and Israel. They spoke Aramaic primarily. They knew Greek, but they spoke with each other in, in Aramaic. They did not ag- adopt the culture of the outside world. Be kind of like, you know, certain Mennonites. That are the strong Mennonites, right? That they, they still hold to their roots. They study their history. Uh, they can still speak German, maybe. Uh, maybe not. Uh, they, they make all the, the Zwiebach and all the different things, you know, baked goods. And they're, they go to the MCC sale. They're all in Mennonite, right? And then you've got other Mennonites that have become worldly, right? Uh, the, the Hellenized Mennonites, right? That maybe they don't, they haven't been to an MCC sale for a long time. Uh, they don't quilt, uh, or they, uh, they, they don't make all the, the baked goods that the, the Mennonites do. They become a, a part of a different culture, right? And then you've got others of us, we're not Mennonite at all, we're grafted in. That's, that's a story for another later in, in Acts. Uh, those people like us. But uh, as far as Mennonites are, that'd be kind of like what's going on here. So you've got the, the Hellenistic Jews and you've got the Hebraic Jews. And the Hellenistic Jews were being overlooked as the church, you know, where they were collecting money and they were taking care of the needy within them. And part of the needy were the widows. And so they were daily giving food to the widows in need. And the, the Hellenistic Jews were saying, we're being overlooked. You're giving it to the Hebraic Jews, their widows more. Or maybe totally, we don't know exactly know the whole problem, the extent of this problem. But they were being overlooked. Maybe the, the food ran out by the time it got to the Hellenistic Jews. So they, they come and they, they raise this complaint to the apostles. Verse 2. <clears throat> it says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose the whole group. The disciples might have been the 120. We're not exactly sure who the whole group was, if they had all 5,000 people from the church together or like the 120 that met at Pentecost and were the original kind of disciple group. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon. Timon's not just a Disney character, kids. He's not just a mere cat. Uh, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Laying their hands oftentimes is just a sign of an extension. There's different different uses of for laying on the hands, but it was it's it's a lot of times an extension of the person. They're saying, "Okay, you are representing us." So the apostles laid hands on them and say, "We are giving you the authority to take care of this and handle this." So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Lord God, I ask that you bless our time now as we study your word. May it refresh us. 
quiet our spirits so that we can hear what it is that you want to say to us specifically today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see here that Satan attacks by division within the church to distract us from our mission. Right, this could have distracted the apostles. And they said, no, this is not going to distract us from what we were called to do. But does it mean that the, it was not a real problem? You know, are, were, were they saying that this is not an important issue? Now, they, 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 when we have problems in the church, a lot of times they are real, important problems. But they still can distract us or they sometimes we give more emotional energy to them than they deserve so point one is that we need to, to discern how much attention a problem deserves how much attention does a problem deserve in this case it was widow care was this a big problem yeah were the apostles being arrogant, you know, by saying that they didn't have time to serve tables? You know, hey, we need, our job is to, to, to preach and to pray. We don't wait on tables. You, you first reading, that's how it could sound, right? That they thought they were too high and mighty for such a menial task as this of taking care of widows, right? That's, that's not the case, because what did they do here? They appointed seven men that were full of the Holy Spirit. Right? They didn't say, just, just pick, pick seven people that can, you know, can manage things well. Just, just pick, pick seven. Any, any, anybody can do this job. Just pick seven people and, and make this. No. They said... These have got to be high-quality guys, full of wisdom and of the Spirit to wait on tables, right? Waiting on tables, is not a, it was not a derogatory term as it kind of sounds um, in English. The word is diakonos, which is where we get the word deacon from. These were the first deacons, you could say. Deacon, the diakonos, deacon means serve. Our job as apostles is not to serve food. Doesn't mean it's not important, right? Because uh, in James 1.27, it says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Is caring about orphans and caring about widows important? Yeah, it's not some kind of a secondary mission. It is what the church needs to be doing. But we all have different different roles, and that wasn't the roles of the apostles. But they said, pick some godly men to do this. So what, 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 what are some things that in the American church today can become issues Right, can become problems that, that could become divisive, have become divisive. Worship music, obviously. Is that a big problem? It, it, it is an issue. And it is something that we need to consider and we need to spend time on. It's not that it's not important. But sometimes we can, you know, elevate it above the mission. False teachings. Important. If there's false teaching... We are called to call out. It's it's very important. That that demands a high amount of energy. But that can also become a distraction. Paint color. Paint color. Is it important? Yes, it is important. If our walls in here uh, were neon green... It would be a distraction, the paint color itself. And, and you know, your paint color can be so bad that people don't want to 
come to your church. He gives a bad first impression. And, and, and it, it starts things off wrong. So is it a big issue? It's an issue. It's, is it important? Yeah. How big is it? You know, we got, you know, how much emotional energy do we want to spend on it? But it's, it's not like it's not an issue, but it shouldn't divide us. Recently, we, you know, COVID has become an issue. And we've let it become really big. And we let it become really divisive. And it's distracted from our mission. It's, it, it, if it creates disunity, we're not going to be the church that God's called us to be. We cannot let issues like this divide us. There is a time for churches to divide. Denominations aren't bad, in my opinion. Right? Because some people feel very strongly, for example, that a woman should not be a pastor, the teaching pastor. And there's good reason for that in the Bible. It would be hard for you to sit into it in a church where a woman is leading the pastor. Should you leave and go to a different church? Probably so, and it's okay then to have different churches that believe different things on these things. It doesn't mean that they're not Christian. But, you know, uh, if, it, if you want to be at a church that, you know, believes certain things that are non-essentials, because you know, there's, there's ranks to, to truth in Scripture. It's not like, I mean, somebody's right about the woman, you know, as, as pastor issue. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. There's not, it's not relative. There's truth. Uh, and, and with a lot of things in the Bible, there is a right and a wrong. Uh, true one, but it doesn't have to doesn't mean that you're necessarily not a Christian because you believe one over the other. There are things that are essential to believe if you're a Christian. Salvation. How are you saved? That's essential. Right? If you believe that you're saved by works, that's not, you're not another denomination. You're another, another religion. Right? But it's okay to have different denominations where we choose you know, different styles of worship. Some people, you know, you go to a lot of African churches, <clears throat> African-American churches, they'll, they'll, they'll worship for three hours and they're dancing and jumping and it's exciting and it's a lot of fun church together, you know. But other people aren't going to be comfortable with that. And that's okay. Worship your way and you worship your way, but we're still united. We're together. I went to a church in <clears throat> college because we had to do this for our, one of our missiology classes. We had to go to a church where we weren't uh, comfortable. And I went to a, uh, a church they sent me to. It was a biker church. Uh, and me and three girls from, from Biola went there. And it was on like a Wednesday night. And uh, we, we show up, and I thought, well, we'll just th- all th- four of us sit together. Well, immediately they, they came and talked to us, and they said, well, the girls are in that room. The women are in that room. And so I'm now alone, <clears throat> little preppy Jeremy, and <clears throat> uh, in this room with all these biker guys. Leather Jack is big. They're all like twice as big as me. And I'm just sitting in the back trying to be uh, myself and, you know, and just experience what's going on. It was really interesting and really cool. At the end of it, they all, you know, got together. And they came up for a holy huddle and prayer. At the, and so, I, you know, I had to go up there. And so I'm up there like this. You know, I got spanky in front of me. And, uh, you know, all these people. and <clears throat> it, was, it was a sight, uh, I'm sure. Uh, you know, that's great. They, they've got their way of worshiping and their way of doing things. And, you know, I got my way. It's okay. We, but we're united together in mission. It's okay to have the different denominations as long as we don't, Uh, turn on each other as long as we can work together for the greater good. All right, point two, focus on solutions rather than the problem. So there is a problem. It's a real problem. Sometimes we focus too much on the problem and not the solution. Some people just like to dwell on the negatives and all they can see is the problems and they, they create drama wherever they go, and they exacerbate the problem. They make the problems much, much bigger than they need to be. Don't be that person. 
A lot of times uh, we only see the problem and we can't see the way out because we're limited as human beings, right? But with God, there's always a solution. And a lot of times we don't think outside the box. It means we don't go to the person who is outside the box, and that's God, and say, God, I don't see any way out of this. But with you, there's a way. That's why we need to be meeting on you know, these prayer meetings. Tuesdays, we'll be having these prayer meetings. We're going to have once a month prayer meetings. If you can't make Tuesdays, we'll have a night of prayer um, every month that, that Judy will be um, organizing and arranging that. <clears throat> It'll be a shorter time uh, as well. But try it out. Come out on a Tuesday and just, just sit there and, and listen. And if you don't want to, uh, if you're you know, concerned about whether you can pray out loud. But we, need to, we need to expand our view of God. With God, there are possibilities. So, of course, we're going to pray and give it to him. But so often, I mean, every day we're tempted to just look at the material world, look at what we can see, and what we can see are possibilities. Say, nope, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. And we don't go to God and think, no, but with God, there's a way. So let's focus on solutions rather than the problem. Three, let's stay on mission. Don't let the little things become the big things. The big thing is the mission. Our church's mission statement is to to help people find faith in Christ and to develop Christ-like people. Help people find faith in Christ and develop Christ-like people. We, We basically unpacked the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've commanded you. That's our mission. We need to be on mission. A church is not on mission, it's just a club. And that's not what we want to be. We need to be a church on mission. Stay on mission. Don't let the little things become the big things. It's dangerous. We need to be about the great commandment. We've got the great commission. We've got the great commandment. Love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we've got to be about as a church. That's how we win people to Christ, how we, how we lead them to him. It's by loving God with all our heart, loving our neighbor as ourself. Stay on mission. And fourth, remember... You can't do everything. And this is what we really see in this passage. What were the apostles doing? Why were they handing this off to other guys? Because they understood they can't do everything. We are going to be distracted from the purpose that God gave us as apostles if we're spending our time doing this. We need to be doing this. You might need to enlist the help of other people like the apostles. This is true, you know, pastors as, as well. I'm going to read something I, that I found online that I thought was funny. This is not for a pity party for pastors. No, nope. it's just funny. But uh, the pastor, you know, doesn't have every gift. But a lot of times we expect the pastor to have every gift. Right? This is why we have ministry teams, or, or we call them boards here, but I like the term team better because we're teams working together on the mission. But there's a, a, a chain letter the, called the perfect pastor. It says the perfect pastor preaches exactly 10 minutes. I'm already over that. Uh, he condemns sin roundly, but never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. until midnight and is also the church janitor. The perfect pastor makes $40 a week, wears good clothes, drives a good car, buys good books, and donates $30 a week to the church. He's 29 years old and has 40 years experience. Is that not true? Above all, he is handsome. All right. Uh, Thanks, my wife. (laughs) The perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with teenagers, and he spends most of his time with the senior citizens. 
He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to the church. He makes 15 home visits a day uh, and is always in his office to be handy when needed. The perfect pastor always has time for church council and all of its committees. He never misses the meeting of any church organization and is always busy evangelizing the unchurched. The perfect pastor is always in the next church over. If your pastor does not measure up, simply send this notice to six other churches that are tired of their pastors too. Then bundle up your pastor and send him to the church at the top of the list. If everyone cooperates in one week, you will receive 1,643 pastors. One of them should be perfect. Have faith in this letter. One church broke the chain and got its old pastor back in less than three months. Uh, yeah, we can, we can put these kind of expectations on, on pastors, right? You, you look at our history of pastors, uh, those who've been around here just in this church for a, long, for a long time, you've seen different styles of pastoring. We all have different gifts. I don't think any of us probably have the same gift. But then we compare one pastor to the other pastor. I've not had this here. I'm not complaining, okay? Uh, and and it, I'm just giving this as an example for future pastors so you treat them well as, as well as you're treating me. But, uh, you know, you've been to different churches. You've seen different styles of pastoring. We can't expect them all to do the same thing. But sometimes we can compare. Well, this pastor knew everybody's names. They loved everybody. and They were always personable. But how was their teaching? You know? Or this pastor is a great teacher. He's really deep, you know, but... He's in his office all the time, and he's never out in the community, right? And so, you know, we can, I'm not saying about about different pastors here, just in general. We can, you know, look at what I like this about that pastor, and then we want every pastor to do all of those things, and we don't all have the same gifts, and neither do you. And this is what's important. You don't have all the gifts, and you can put unrealistic expectations on yourself that you have to be able to do everything. There's a need in the church. Okay, I've got to do that. That might not be your gifting. And it's okay to say no. Okay, it's a dangerous thing to say, but it's okay to say no. You need to know your gifts and your calling. How has God equipped you, and what has God called you to do so you can stay on task? I'm going to go through some gifts here. Uh, the, in the New Testament, there's three you know, major lists, two longer ones, of gifts of the Spirit. And different people see these different, different ways uh, they define them differently because Paul doesn't give us a definition. And so, you know, we can have some different defi- definitions of what the gifts are and how they're used. And that's okay because we, God's word's not completely clear on that. Um, and then there's different views on like, are, are all these lists just incomplete lists, but you combine them together and these are all the different kinds of gifts plus others that, just, that Paul didn't mention. He just mentioned certain ones. That's one way of looking at this. And there's different kind of uh, spiritual gifts tests that you can take where they're just taking any gift that's mentioned in Scripture, and that's all just a big pool of gifts. And that is one way, and that's possible. That's, I kind of lean that, that way a lot of times. And then other times I lean the way that I'm going to tell you, tell you now. Um, in that these lists are different because they're describing different types of gifts or purposes of the gifts. That there's, there are offices uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, there are gifts that are manifestations of the Spirit when the, the Spirit uh, comes in at the moment to show himself like speaking in tongues um, and healing. And then there are what some people call the motivational gifts, which is what we're going to look at here in Romans. Some people call them the grace gifts, motivational gifts. And in this theory of the gifts, and these are all theories, there's no way you can be 100% dogmatic. You shouldn't be dogmatic about this because 
Paul wasn't. We don't know. Paul was, he wasn't explaining spiritual gifts for us. Nowhere does he explain spiritual gifts. It would be nice if he did that. But he was responding to crises within the church. And in Corinthians, they were being disunified because of spiritual gifts. Because those who were speaking in tongues and had some of these outward gifts thought that they were better than everybody else who didn't. And they, were, they, they elevated themselves over everyone and looked down on them because, oh, you're not as spiritual. You don't have as much of the Holy Spirit because you're not doing what we're doing. We're speaking in tongues. And so he talked about unity in the church. And that's why the first Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, it's sandwiched in between 12 and 14, which are about spiritual gifts. Because the purpose of love is saying that love is more important than the spiritual gifts. If you have all the spiritual gifts, but you don't have love, it's nothing. And then in Romans, he's again talking about unity in the body and the need for the body. Um, as uh, he talks about these what some people refer to as the motivational gifts or the grace gifts. And in this theory, you have one or one dominant one of these. And so I'm going to list them out here for you. And it's an interesting way of thinking about it, and it's, it's possibly the right way to think about it. I don't know for sure. I'm not being dogmatic on this. Romans, 1, or Romans 12, 4 through 8 says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, different parts of your body, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. The grace, the empowering of the Holy Spirit gives us different gifts. Some people interpret that to say that you have one of these you know, or one dominant. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's it encouraging, in, uh, to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it ge- diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I don't have a long time to go into these, but I'm going to just give you just a quick little definition of kind of how I see these. And I could be wrong, but... And maybe just see what, what resonates with you. What, what, what is your gifting, do you think? Prophecy. Prophecy, this is probably the one that's the most confusing and creates the most uh, disagreement when you talk about spiritual gifts. But, you know, it's, it's, it's God speaking, it's speaking God's truth into a situation. Okay, uh, it may be the person who has a gift of prophecy. You know, the situation's happening, and a scripture comes to mind that is appropriate for this time. Or maybe it's a vision or a, a, a dream, uh, something. But maybe God speaks to them more in the moment. Within with any of these, uh, all these gifts, we all can do them. Just even if you don't have the gift, like mercy, we're all called to be merciful, right? But some people have a gift of mercy. Some people have a gift of prophecy. It doesn't mean that other people aren't given prophetic words in different times in the moment. I think God speaks through a lot of us, and we're probably not even calling it prophecy. You know, you, you, lots of you, if, uh, maybe all of you, have had the, the, a time where you're in a situation and the situation is too big for you. You know, I, I've done this where I'm counseling people and they're coming to me with an issue. I've never dealt with this before. And I'm thinking, God, how do I, how do I help? Who am I to do this? And I start praying as they're talking, I'm praying. And then out of my mouth comes words that I know aren't mine. They're the thoughts that I'm saying and that I know are not from me because I've never dealt with this before. It's inspired. Sometimes when I'm preaching, usually when I'm preaching, I, you know, I feel like God is speaking through me. Um, and sometimes I feel like he's not. Like I'm just, okay, I wrote these words down and I'm, I'm going to get through this message and hopefully it'll teach well, uh, but other times I feel like 
like, yeah, this is, this is, this is the spirit working right now. We're entering into prophecy. You know, where you've given a word of comfort to somebody in the moment and encouraged them could be prophecy without saying, thus saith the Lord. And I don't think you should say, thus saith the Lord, or God told me this. That's prophecy. Service, meeting the practical needs of someone, of others. And some people are more drawn to meeting the practical needs. Teaching, explaining God's truth. You have, if you, you, know, you have different pastors, and if, if they're, they have more of the gift of teaching, they're going to teach or preach a different way than somebody who has the gift of prophecy. Encouragement, building others up in service. Uh, you, you see people's potential, and you want to help them get there. Uh, giving, supplying money or resources to meet needs. Usually people who have the gift of giving, God also blesses financially. It's like they can't just... They keep giving it away, and God keeps providing so they can keep meeting the money and resources uh, of others. Leadership, organizing people to accomplish tasks. They just know how to make, coordinate everybody and make things work. Uh, oh, and mercy, empathizing and showing compassion to those who are hurting. Uh, to summarize this, Bill Gothard, because this, this, this has been around for a long time, this idea of these, that you have one of these, is your motivational gift. Like, this is what drives you, you know? So if a, if a situation happens, there's a problem, what's going to drive you? How are you going to want to respond to that? Uh, Bill Gothard gives this illustration of uh, seven people around a dinner table having dinner together. The hostess walks in with a dessert tray, and she accidentally spills the tray. How would the seven people representing these seven gifts respond? And this might help you can identify which one you are. The person with the gift of prophecy would say, that's what happens when you're not careful. Right? Uh, they're convicting. Uh, you know, a lot of times they're very black and white and blunt, people with the gift of prophecy. Not always. Uh, the person with the gift of serving might say, I'll help you clean it up. Right? She has the desire to meet a practical need. There's a mess. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and I'm going to take care of that. The person with the gift of teaching might say, you know, the reason the tray fell is you put too many things on the whist side and you need to balance the weight more carefully. You know, he's wanting to clarify truth. The person with the gift of exhortation would say, don't let this stop you from hostessing. This mistake will only make you better, right? You, you, you got, God's gifted you to hostess. You, you can do this, right? They're concerned, this person is concerned about her calling and the willingness to be obedient in the future. The person with the gift of gifting would say, I'll buy new desserts. Yeah. Uh, and he used the personal assets to meet the practical need. The person with the gift of mercy would respond by hugging the hostess and saying, it's okay, don't feel badly, it could happen to anyone. Right? She, he doesn't care about the dessert. He doesn't care about the seven people around the table. He's empathizing with that one person who is in distress at the time. And the person with the gift of leading would respond to the spilled dessert by saying, Bob, would you get some towels to wipe up the table? Mary, grab the mop to the floor. Uh, Jane, help me fix some more desserts. That's the gift of leading. All these gifts are important. All these gifts are necessary to be the church. And we all have different ones. And we need each other. So what has God called you to do. How has God equipped you and what has he called you to do? You need to spend time with him and learn this and know this. Because that helps you stay on target. Stay on tasks. The, the apostles understood it. They knew it. Our, our responsibility, what God has called us to do is to teach the word and to pray. And that probably included praying with people. We can't be distracted by these other things. doesn't mean that they, ever, they never did anything else. But they knew how they were equipped and what God had called them to do. You need to know that. And fifth, lastly, oh, and if you don't know, let's talk. You know, I'd love to talk to you about this and let's work this out. Let's, let's start talking and praying together. 
And lastly, enlist the help of those with the right gifting and calling, just like the apostles did. We don't have the gifting and calling for this. We're going to enlist these guys, and we're going to empower them to do that work. And it's interesting, you know, two of those guys are mentioned later as we go on, Philip and Stephen. Go on to do great things. They weren't just, they ended up, I don't know, they, didn't, they ended up doing more than the organizing this, probably because, you know, they got the thing working, and now they could move on to, to doing other things as well. And Philip is going to become a great evangelist, and Stephen's going to become the first martyr. We're going to see here next week. But what was the result of all this? The church grew. So the church grew. The word of God spread. When we are on mission, when we are living out what God has called us to do, the word of God's going to spread. The church is going to thrive. The lost are going to be found. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you've given us a body, that we don't have to do this alone. You've given us the church. We are not meant to walk this Christian life alone. I thank you that, that the early church didn't let this problem divide them and distract them from the mission. And I pray, Lord, you help us have wisdom as a church when issues arise that we put them in perspective, that we remember the mission, we stay on target, we stay unified for your glory, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together.
before you all tell me no when I ask you to do something, let me clarify here. Uh, no. um, Moses said no to God, and I'm not, not God, but Moses said no to God because he didn't understand his gifts, right? Uh, and so sometimes we say no to things because of uh, fear, we think we can't do that. And we don't realize that God's calling us, and if God calls us to do something, he will empower us to do it. And sometimes we don't see our gifts yet because we haven't been stepping out in faith and doing ministry. And sometimes other people see our gifts in us that we don't see in ourselves. And we need to call them out of people. Um, And so all that happens when we're spending time in prayer. We need to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is leading us when to prompt us to say, go talk to that person and call them out. Say, hey, I see this in you. Or for you to realize what your own gifting is and say, okay, and and calling and say, oh, is that what you're calling me to do? I can't do that. And he's saying, no, 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 keep doing it. You got got to do this. Step out in faith. Trust me. We need to be spending time in prayer. Join us Tuesday if you can uh, in the hearth room. Let's close with the doxology and give him some glory. Have a great day.